Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. The Salamander Letter wasn't the only forgery caught by Brent Ashworth. In our next conversation with Brent, we'll talk about other forgeries that uh, Brent caught and how Mark Hoffman reacted when he pointed those out. Check out our conversation. You won't want to miss it. By the way, I'm giving away a free copy of uh, William E. McClellan's Lost Manuscript. Brent Ashworth was instrumental in finding this, and it's not a forgery. This is a real manuscript from William McClellan, the early apostle. And uh, this book is very rare. So if you'd like to win it, um, go to gospeltangents.com Ashworth, and you could win an autographed copy by Brent of this book here. So sign up today. Now back to our conversation. Well, I told him early on that my favorite scripture was Mosiah 2.17, and I paid 5000 for that little you know, fragment early on. Um, let's see, we did the Al Capone. Uh, Lucy Mack here. Uh, oh, right before the press conference on Lucy Mack, I was going to tell you, Hoffman comes to my house. Press conference is set for Monday. Hoffman came on Saturday to, the, to our, our home, the living room of our old home. Uh, Tracy, remember that? And uh, so Hoffman's in there, and he leans on me. He says, uh, well, Brent, you know, uh, they're going to probably do the same thing to you that they did with me on the Anthon. And I says, like something evil they're going to do to me at the church because I got this set up press conference for Monday. I said, well, what's that, Mark? He says, well, they're going to lean on you to donate it to the church, you know, to give it to them. That's why I felt like I had to give in to a deal, you know, on the Anthon. And I says, if they ask for it, I'll give it to him. <laughs> so I said, I just shot him down. I mean, he was, I think he really thought he had me there. But uh, as I look back on it, you know, at the time I couldn't figure out, well, who's worried about that? You know, the church wants it, they can have it. <laughs> wow. You know, so that was his character, too. He was always trying to, he was trying to, as I look back, he was always trying to stick a wedge in there somewhere. But it never worked. The closest came on that one letter, you know, he was going to read me, but. My dad solved that one. Uh, let's see. Uh, there were a couple of small incidents I should mention. There were lots of small incidents, but just a couple of might be of interest. One in 84 before the General Dunham mess that we you know, got involved with. There was another thing that had been promised me earlier, and that was a, uh, a revelation of the prophets, uh, which uh, he'd showed me a copy of one time, Mark did, uh, to re- handwritten by him to his brother, Hiram Smith. And uh, it was really unusual, uh, and I made him promise to give me a first right of refusal on it, okay? Uh, I learned early on that his promises didn't mean a whole lot, but uh, that was another time earlier, and I was still dealing with him at the point, at that point. Well, uh, it was a couple months later, before the Dunham thing again, that, uh, that I, I'm over at Deseret Book, and I see Dean Jesse's new book is out. And it's the personal writings of Joseph Smith, and I'm thumbing through there, and and uh, and I'm I'm seeing uh, this this revelation, you know, to Hiram, and I'm thinking, what's the deal? He he offered me this this thing, you know, uh, so I went straight up to his home, and of course he's not there when you don't, you know, when you want him, he's not there, and Dory was there behind the screen door, and I just I was really angry, <laughs> I didn't want to go in, and I just says, hey, you know. I held the book up, and I says, this revelation was promised to me, you know. I guess it was sold to church, which is fine, but, you know, the guy lied to me, you know. thought we had a deal on it. So she didn't have anything to say because she didn't know what to say. And so I went straight down to Don Schmidt, the church archivist. And Don had been our home teacher when I was a boy, so I, I knew him pretty well. And I went and I says, hey, Don, I says, I understand you picked up this this." Revelation that's printed in Dean's new book. He says, yeah, we got that from Mark. I says, well, I just want you to know that was promised to me earlier, okay? And um, we hadn't we hadn't gotten around to pricing or anything like that yet, but it was promised to me, and I didn't get it. And uh, he said, I was really angry, and I just said, you know, Mark's a real liar, you know? He's a liar, he cheats. And I remember Don saying, now, just calm down, Brent. You know, calm down, you know, you shouldn't get so worked up. I says, look, just as a member of the church, I'm just warning you to be careful dealing with him. So this was before the Dunham thing, and I'm already, you know, pretty upset about all of that. So um, I get to Mark's house the following Wednesday, and Mark just lays into me about this. 
how dare you tell Don Schmidt that I'm, you know, a liar and that this and that and so on. And I want you to march down right now with me. I said, no way in the world I'm going to do that. I told him the truth, you know. <laughs> you are a liar. <laughs> oh, yeah, you are a liar. And I, he was very angry at me. But I look back now and I can see four definite times when he was angry at me. One was when I came up with the real John Taylor Journal. And that was announced, you know. And uh, he was angry that the Salt Lake Tribune was saying I'd gotten that from him. He was, Hoffman was angry about that because he hadn't. He didn't oh, have anything yeah. to do with it. Which led me to think years later after he went to jail that he was very proud of his work product. Okay? <laughs> So he wanted me to go to the press right there and tell him that, uh, you know, that, that I did not get that from Mark Hoffman, you know. Hmm. And, and I remember telling him at the time, well, Mark, you're the only one that discloses my sources to anybody. I don't tell where I, where I get anything. He was angry at that, too, mm -hmm. okay. So that's one of the two times, too. Um, and then, like I t said, told you earlier about the Salamander letter, when he first offered me that, uh, the price was higher. It was fifty grand, uh, and I told him the only time I ever told him. Well, there was one other time I should say. There were two times I remember where I told him an item was a forgery, but I didn't know the other item was connected to him till later. But at any rate, that was a Lincoln piece. I'll have to tell you about that. But at any rate, the point is, is that uh, he was very angry at me. He waved his finger at me like this. He says it's authentic. By this time, uh, at this time, we just thought Lynn Jacobs had discovered it in a bunch of old uh, address leaves back in Boston. He was a student there at, uh, at Harvard, divinity student. And he was a collector, and, a, and he was Mark's best friend. So we figured that he, you know, uh, that it was Lynn Jacobs doing. I didn't know that Lynn had been paid 10000 bucks to say that. Lynn later told me that before he died, but anyway. What I understand was the police were putting a lot of pressure on him because I think they'd found out it was a forgery and then Lynn finally said, yeah, I didn't really find it. Mark told me. Right. And then he did. And, and he felt really upset about that when I learned, when I talked to Lynn later in his life before he died. He uh, said, oh, that was a big, big mistake. You know, yeah. he said he wished he'd never done that. But uh, we always thought Lynn was was discovering the biggest piece, you know, the salamander letter. That's what we thought. Yeah, the, uh, the Netflix documentary <laughs> doesn't even mention Lynn. Oh, no. And, no. and it just everything's all Mark. But this, oh, that, everything's all Mark. Technically, but Lynn was the one who found technically that. Technically, Lynn's the one that found it. He's the one that took it to President Hinckley. Mm -hmm. And he was the wrong guy to send to President Hinckley because he tried to blackmail him. <laughs> yeah. President Hinckley wasn't interested in the paying, church paying 50000 and kindly showed him the door. This is what Salamander, George Rockmore, and everybody wrote. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and on the way out the door, he says, well, you know, we're going to offer it to Brent Ashworth. And President Hinckley says, well, that's all right. Brent's a friend of ours, <laughs> which I was happy to read that in the Salamander. That's where I wrote it. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, the point was, is that Lynn was the, was Mark's bosom buddy, you know. And another example of that is a hymn book that I bought. Uh, it was in 1835. The second rarest Mormon book after the Book of Commandments is Emma Smith's little hymn book. Okay, from 1835. And I've only had one book of commandments, and I've only had two of the hymn books. But they're very rare. And uh, the, the, uh, the first hymn book I got was, uh, it looked complete and everything. It was sold to me for $10,000 by Mark Hoffman. Uh, after the bombing and everything was over, and they found out that it had a phony last page in it, which was just an index page, okay? But uh, like Pete Crawley, the book expert, said, uh, even a page like that cuts the value of the book in half. It should have been 5000 instead of ten. Now that's a half million or more dollar book, okay? It's a very oh, really? rare book. Wow. And so a page would cut it down to a quarter million or something now if it was a phony page. But um, uh, I, that was the only piece I can remember during that whole Hoffman time that I ever sold during that period. I hung on to most everything he had. But I sold that to another collector, to a friend, and uh, who wanted to complete his book collection. I was more of a book collector than I was. I'm more of a manuscript collector. But I do like books if they're inscribed or something like that. And, uh, uh, and then after the Hoffman deal, when it was uh, proven that, or, or the guy uh, sent it back and they found out about the, uh, the page that was missing that had been supplied by Hoffman, and uh, I remember the FBI came down to my, uh, the detective came down to my store, and uh, it was after Mark had gone to prison now, and had, uh, had, had shown me the, uh, uh, you know, the phony page, or it was before he was, it was after he was indicted anyway. But it had shown me the, 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 uh, 
He says, this last page in this hymn book you sold was, was fake. And I argued with him. I said, well, look, officer, it's even got the same uh, watermark through the last page as the page before. And he said, oh, that's because they printed it on a, on a blank page. You know, they have the same watermark. And I'm arguing with him. I says, you know, I just don't see how that could possibly be a fake. And I remember the detective pulled out the original printer's plate that they found the mark had used to print that page with. Oh, you're kidding. No. And I felt like an idiot. I'd worked with the police for years, but that silenced me at that point, you know. Wow. And he says, you'll also notice that the plate is slightly smaller than the previous page. So it's not exactly the same size, even though it looks like it, because the page has got the same, the same watermark across it, because wow. they used a blank, sh blank end sheet, you know, to print it on. And uh, I asked Lynn about that later, because uh, uh, you know Lynn's name was all through it, because he uh, uh, helped Mark with it, and they'd sold it to me. And Lynn says Mark told me that uh, whoever he sold it to, he's going to notify him that that page was a phony. I says, well, he certainly didn't. Oh, you know? brother. But Lynn knew about it. In fact, Lynn had helped Mark, you know, find the page he needed to get printed, and I guess uh, Mark had made a plate. But uh, the point was is that uh, we always kind of thought Lynn was the artiste, you know. The, the Mark, couldn't, Mark couldn't write a sentence that looked very good, his own handwriting. You know what I mean? I mean, right. I've, got his, I've got his mission uh, diaries. I need to get a picture of the mission diaries. Yeah, I've got his mission diaries. Terrible. I don't have them here, but I've got them. I had them the other day. And I uh, had his mission diaries, and they're, they're the only example of his cursive writing, but it's in between mostly printed writing, like he did later. It's really sloppy, not very good, and so on. I mean, even on his mission, he's covering his handwriting, okay? <laughs> of course, we know he's collecting anti-Mormon books, too. His, right. uh, several of his companions told him to dump them on uh, transfers, and he, he didn't. He kept them. So but there, there also were a couple of other things. Uh, one other I should mention is the Bridger note. Uh, there was uh, some, uh, he ac had actually some, some actual notes signed by Jim Bridger, you know, <laughs> The great uh, uh, mountain man. Right. And but there's a sign with an X, of course, because Jim Bridger can't write. And somebody written Jim Bridger and it had an X in the middle of it. And uh, and I was really enamored with Western autographs as much as I am with uh, LDS uh, autographs and and uh, and uh, in American history. And uh, and so I, I bugged him when he showed me that. And he says. Uh, He's, he, I think I paid him $5,000 for that first one. But he said, this is the only one. You know, I've never seen another. At any rate, I learned within a month that he'd sold four others of these. Okay. And I was really angry over that. But he didn't have an answer for that either, you know. One story I'm just thinking of while we're sitting here, and maybe I should mention, is that uh, I bought some, uh, some photographs. Some, uh, they were of Butch Cassidy's gang. And they were uh, police photographs, you know, uh, to identify members of Butch Cassidy's gang. They looked old, but what they were was Hoffman had taken old carte de visite, the little French-sized photographs, and, and put phony mug shots on each of these real, uh, you know, uh, sheets, police sheets. And he had, uh, had, had uh, uh, filed off the back of them so they could put lines and put the information like they would on a police blotter on the back, which they did in the 1800s, on each of these outlaws, okay? And uh, uh, I had like six or eight of them, and I s kept a couple of them. I kept uh, the one of the Fort, Fort Worth Five, which was the famous photo. They were just photographs, but... Uh, uh, but the others I sold to, uh, uh, to my mentor, a guy by the name of uh, Niall Anderson, who owned Beehive Collector's Gallery. Uh, he died at age 90 about four or five years ago. But a uh, great guy. He kind of took me under his wing early on and uh, kind of became my mentor. And I sold him to him. And uh, this is a story I haven't thought of until just now for a lot of years. But uh, it was a week or so before the bombs went off. I'm into Niall's. And Niles an expert on a lot of things, especially photographs. And he tells me, he says, well, these are fake. And I, you know, I said, well, gosh, what makes you think that? They, they look good to me. He says, no, the photographic paper is wrong. He says, and he took it to the site. He, can, he says, can you see where these uh, images have been pasted onto this board? Not that, because they were, the originals were pasted too, but uh, he said, 
you can see a white line all the way around them. He says the, 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 the type of photographic paper they used back then was perfectly flat. I mean, it was uh, so, so thin that there was never any white line around it. He says, these are fakes. And I remember calling Mark up, uh, trying to get a hold of him, and I couldn't. It was like a day or two before Steve was killed. And, uh, uh, but I, was, I had in mind, I'm going to return these. These are fakes, you know. Uh, there was another time that I was in uh, D uh, Deseret Book Rare Books with Kurt Bench, and Kurt shows me this rare Lincoln uh, debate book. Uh, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, published only one book in his lifetime, and that was, he did it on his own, the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates. He published them, 1858. He lost those debates because in he probably won the debates, but he lost the debates because he lost the election, you know, to Douglas and just had to run for president two years later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but he printed up his debates, you know, because a lot of people wanted to read them. They thought they were excellent on, uh, on the slavery issues and, and the states and the territories that could be allowed to move, in, move into and so on. They were brilliant, and they've been studied ever since. But uh, there were about... 17, 18 copies of it, the Lincoln inscribed mm -hmm. to close friends. And half of those inscriptions are in pencil. Now, remember I told you about Hoffman and pencil, which I think is an important distinction that's been missed by it a really lot of is, people. Yeah. I think it's an important thing. So I got a lot of those pencil ones as well as ink ones. But uh, none of the pencils were ever charged because there's no, no test. test for pencil as such, just comparisons. And so... Uh, at any rate, I was with Kurt, and Kurt shows me this uh, original, you know, the book was fine. It was, a, Kaufman had no respect for history. It was a first edition or whatever of Lincoln's Douglas Debates, 1860 is when they were published during the camp, presidential campaign. He publishes the, the 58 debates, and uh, 1858 debates. Anyway, um, so I'm looking at the handwriting. It's inscribed by Abraham Lincoln. And if there's anybody's handwriting that I really know very well, it's Lincoln's. So I'm looking at this. And it's not Lincoln's, you know. I mean, it's it, 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 it it's not even close in a lot of ways. And I told Kurt, I said, "Well, this this is a phony. Somebody's tried to tried to uh, you know sell this to you as a Lincoln, and it's not. It's fake." Well, I went up to uh, Hoffman's the following Wednesday morning, and that's one of the times he really hit the fan. You know, how dare you tell Kurt Bitts that that's a fake and came from? I said, "Mark, I didn't even know that came from you." Oh, really? Yeah, because he never mentioned his source. You know occurred to me but i knew then where it'd come from so you caught him a few times on these versions well i did i should have been a little smarter shouldn't i at any <laughs> rate the, i was buying all you know i bought half of them so uh not that smart but at any rate the point was is that uh i'm not bragging i'm just saying that that i told kurt these are this is fake don't buy it and hoffman was really angry at me that was one of the four times he was angry at me and he laid, laid into me up at his house in Maria Avenue about that. How dare you tell Kurt Bench, you know, that hurts my reputation, this, on and on, you know. I said, well, it's fake, Mark. I, you know, I don't know who you got it from. That's what I said. I had no idea he was a forger, you know, still buying stuff. And, uh, but whoever you got it from, you better return it because it's a fake. Uh, he says, how do you know it's a fake? Well, for one thing, Lincoln's signature uh, goes up. You know, the A is always... Uh, uh, lower than the N, you know? And sometimes it's really, uh, you have to look at it because it's very close in every case. And sometimes Lincoln's signature gets a little sloppy, but that's just a trait Lincoln had throughout his handwriting, you know, is the N of his signature is higher than the A. So I'm teaching the forger where he, where he, where he went wrong, okay, on Lincoln. But uh, he let me have it that, uh, you know, he was going to take it back to whoever he got it from and so on. Uh, anyway, it's uh, kind of hilarious, and none of those were were uh, mentioned in the uh, in the Hoffman case because they were in pencil. You know, that's one of them. Wow! I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Brent Ashworth. In our next conversation, Brent will talk about a tragic accident involving his son. And he was in the um, intensive care for a month and a half, two months there in the hospital between life and death, you know? I mean, it was awful. And this is during the time of the early part of the Hoffman investigation, which we could have cared less about at the point. Uh, in fact, if anything, it got us out of having to contact the media and being a part of the, you know, of the of the early... Frenzy. Yeah, the frenzy that Metcalf met and others. We weren't involved with it because we were 
we had a son in critical condition. So that's that's why we escaped all of that. And a lot of people never heard our story. Not that we cared, but that was, you know, we didn't. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear the entire interview on Cut, sign up at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruptions. If you'd like to see the whole video, that's just $8 a month. And you can sign up either at youtube.com slash gospel tangents or on our website at gospeltangents.com and click the yellow subscribe button. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And I'll just need to make sure that we're Facebook friends and I'll add you to our insiders group and you can see the entire interview uncut. If you'd like to get PDF transcripts of our interviews, those are just $10 a month. And for just $15 a month, I will send you paperback versions of our transcripts um, as soon as they come out. Or, of course, you can uh, buy them on Amazon as well. Uh, go to Amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview, and uh, you can see all of our transcripts there. Don't forget to sign up for our updates at Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents. Of course, you can follow us at Gospel Tangents on Twitter. To hear our interviews updated to your podcast player, go to tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and make sure you give us a five-star review. And of course you should show your support for Gospel Tangents with one of these cool t-shirts like this green one, or light blue, sport gray, royal blue, purple, of course black, beautiful gold, and of course Utah red. I've probably left out some colors, but if you want to see more, go to gospeltangents.com shop, and you can uh, get one of these. So once again, thanks for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again.